Hey, welcome to the ground instruction for exercise 12, which is all about stalls. Your stall training is probably going to be split into two lessons, power off stall entry and recovery and power on entry and recovery. This presentation is going to cover power off stall entry and recovery. So ideally, you've already read through exercise 12 in the flight training manual, so you already know that a wing stall is a loss of lift that results from a high angle of attack. So this lesson is all about how to recognize an oncoming stall, identify a stall, and recover from a stall smoothly and promptly. We will still cover a little bit of theory in this lesson, but if you haven't already watched the ground instruction material for slow flight or exercise 11, I highly recommend that you review it before you continue with this lesson, as we will be skimming over a lot of that material here. Now, before I go any further, I wanna talk about angle of attack. The angle of attack is the angle at which the cord line of your wing meets the oncoming airflow. At low angle of attack, the airflow meets the wing and flows smoothly over it, producing low lift but also low drag. As the angle of attack is increased, more lift is generated at the cost of more drag. Therefore, drag is a byproduct of lift. You can use additional thrust power to overcome this drag, and this is precisely what you're doing to maintain altitude in slow flight. However, if you increase the angle of attack beyond the critical angle, the drag overcomes the lift, the air no longer flows smoothly over the wing, sufficient lift is no longer generated, and the wing enters what is called a stalled condition. What's really important to keep in mind here is that a wing can stall at any airspeed and any attitude. In the images shown below, the blue arrow represents the relative airflow, and the blue triangle represents the angle of attack. We initially teach stall entry from straight and level slow flight. However, you can easily stall in a descent if you increase the angle of attack too quickly, or in a turn if you rapidly increase loading. But those types of stalls will be covered later in your training. So as I said, our approach to stall takes the aircraft through a slow flight condition. Thus, the signs of an approaching stall are the same as the signs of slow flight, mushy controls, stall horn, buffeting, and finally a loss of effectiveness of the elevator. So let's get into what you're going to see and do in this flight lesson. So if you look at the exercise in sequence, it's going to look like this. First, you do your safety check and you find yourself in geofix. Then you pull the car feet out, reduce power by slowly closing the throttle, raise the nose, maintain directional control, recognize the stall, break the stall by pitching forward, and once at a safe airspeed, you can return to the cruise attitude with power. You can recognize a stall by looking for three key indicators, uncommanded pitch, uncommanded roll, or the VSI just goes negative. The most common indicator you'll see if you've done a proper stall entry is the nose drop or uncommanded pitch. It may catch you off guard because you'll have the yoke pulled all the way back and the aircraft will suddenly nose down uncommanded. You might say a combination of all three of these. Once you've recognized the stall, get into the habit of announcing it, verbally call out stall. Because this is a power off recovery, the only tool that we have to regain airflow over the wings is to turn the aircraft nose back into the airflow, which means pitching forward to break the stall. So as you recognize the stall, the pitch comes forward lower than cruise to allow the airspeed to increase and then bring the nose up slightly higher than cruise, add full power and regain any lost altitude. Some common errors that we see in power off stall practice are raising the nose too high in the entry. In your flight test, the criteria is to transition smoothly to a pitch attitude that will induce a stall. If you allow the aircraft to bleed off airspeed and then bring the nose up to an above climb attitude, you will stall and you'll have better control into that entry. Pitching down too much in the recovery is also problematic. The idea is to break the stall. So if you bring the nose down to a level just below cruise, then you will regain airflow over the wings without an excessive loss in altitude. Maintaining directional control and announcing the stall are also part of the flight test criteria. Remember that you will do best to maintain directional control with the rudder, as it has more authority than the ailerons do in this maneuver. Don't let the nose wander around. If it falls too much to one side or the other, get into the habit of picking it up with the rudder. As with any upper airwork maneuver, you must do a safety check before attempting this maneuver. So just make sure that that's part of your criteria before you even set up this exercise. Also in the recovery, just remember the most important thing for a power off recovery is to bring the nose down. The reason we practice power off recovery is because in case you ever have to do a forced approach, you may 
desire to stretch your glide, and that could put you into a stall. So we teach you the power off recovery in case you find yourself in a situation where you have to break a stall without any power available. Here are a couple review questions for you. Go through them, and if you feel comfortable, then move on to part B of this uh, exercise, which is stall, power on stall, entry and recovery, and the addition of flaps.